Hi, this is Ryan Fraser. This is Troy Daney. This is Gus Boyet. This is Don Hutchison. This is Jürgen Klopp, and you're listening to the big interview with Graham Hunter. Thank you, Jürgen. I travelled to all these interviews from Barcelona, and our socios, our beloved members, keep us on the road. This independent podcast would not happen without them. Please go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter right now to become a socio, to become one of our members and get an extra big interview every month, plus loads of bonus content. So go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Graham Hunter, and we'll bring you joy. League Cup final. Blackburn managed by Graham Souness, favourite of mine. Spurs managed by, <clears throat> okay, we share initials if you've listened to this series. Glenn Hoddle. I was so supporting Blackburn and thank you, thank you, thank you. To the coming player of that moment, Matt Janssen, scorer, maker of the winner, made my day. The reason that Matt Janssen isn't to the forefront of your football memory from the early to mid 2000s is that he had a dreadful accident which wasn't his fault, in Rome, doing a Gregory Peck, Audrey Hepburn, skittishly scooting around the eternal city on a moped until, well, very near tragedy stuck. It ruined the remainder of his career and it left him with demons that he had to fight with all his and a very special sports psychologist's efforts in order to resurrect himself. He's an interesting man. He's going to be a good coach. He's been a great guest on the big interview. He was a terrific footballer. But what a life. What a tough life. Matt Janssen. Enjoy. We're um, privileged to be in the presence of somebody that I used to watch and admire, Matt, Matt Janssen. Very welcome to the big interview. Thank you very much. I do like what you've done with your garden. I know this is a recorded thing, people can't see behind you, but the spiffing with the big trees and the beautiful long fairways. This is a place that you frequent, right? Yeah, I used to be a member of the golf course, but I'm still a member of the gym, which I don't uh, get to too many times nowadays. <laughs> but Mottram Hall, is that where we are? Mottram Hall, yeah. Beautiful day, midsummer. Um, horses. I don't bet often. But when I go to oh, so the course, I tend to win more because I look at the parade ring and I always have this feeling that I can look at the, the horses going round, National Hunt rather than flat is my thing. And I always imagine that I can see elegance and balance and character. Now, that might be total nonsense. And the fact that bookies win more than punters suggests that it is. But I remember when I began watching you, which wasn't at Carlisle, it was at Crystal Palace. Uh, largely it was in television, but I was reporting on English football then, so I would come to some of your games, uh, Palace and, and Blackburn. And that's what I remember thinking about watching you um, in your prime, that you were a really unusual mix of elegance. There was a balance and athleticism and a naturalness about your play. There was a toughness, and, and you were willing to put yourself... The, the mix of thoroughbred and able to put yourself in all kinds of sticky situations. I'm not going to disagree with you at all. <laughs> you keep on going if you want. <laughs> um, Hold on, just I'll move the oats out of the way. <laughs> no, I, do you, do you, do you, did you understand what I'm trying to get at? I, I, think I, I think I just grew and grew in confidence and, and, and that helps. I used to, I used to constantly as a, as a kid fall over, bang my head, stand behind a swing, get knocked down and whether it's stupidity or bravery, um, I used to put my head where, where it sometimes got knocked and, and maybe that helped with me in the football, with the, especially 20 years ago when a tackle was a tackle and, a, and an arm across your face was, was very common. So um, maybe the bravery or stupid, stupidity came from growing up really and having numerous bangs to their head. And although you would class yourself as left-footed, I, th- I thought you were reasonably ambidextrous 
and that you had, an, you had an awful lot of ways to score. And the things that probably stood out most about you was you were able to do elite things sometimes, passing, scoring, set up. But you, you did score goals of wonderful quality and they seemed to come naturally to you. Yeah, I, I, loved, I loved scoring goals. I loved setting people up. Uh, it, it didn't happen overnight, though, I don't think. I think it was just a rise of starting at Carlisle, wanting to get into the first team at Carlisle United, doing that and, and my confidence growing. Then suddenly I've got interest from Newcastle, Man United, Crystal Palace... Juventus. Uh, if that, that was that, that was slightly later, but that, uh, then I'm, then I grew in confidence. Ended up going to Crystal Palace. Got young player of the season in the last four or five months, and so my my ego, my ego and confidence grew again. Then they got into financial difficulty, so they had to sell me again. And the interest was, like you say, Juventus came in for me with the likes of Zidane and Del Piero and etc. So my confidence just grew and grew and grew and. And I think that helped me with my uh, ability on the field, that, that I had that much confidence, give me the ball I want to show off, score great goals or, or, or set people up comfortably. Um, I think it stemmed from me just growing that ego and getting that self-belief. You're about to play for England and potentially about to go to the World Cup. Your brother-in-law's kid... Oh, my sister's kid. My brother, yeah, sister's yeah, kid yeah. had a bug. Yeah, well, they lived next door to me. He'd finished university and he ended up sorting out my affairs, uh, became my agent, really. Yeah. And they lived... We, we had properties in, in, in city centre Manchester, um, two, two apartments next to each other. And his kid, Eden, had gastroenteritis. But anyway, I got... We were, we were at Carden Park. I was, we were playing Paraguay at Anfield. And I was there, and training went really well. I was partnered up front with, with Michael Owen. Is this the, this is the Ericsson era, right, for England? Ericsson's the coach? Ericsson's the coach, yeah. Training went brilliant the first day, and then during the evening I felt awful, virtually hallucinating, just sick. It was coming out of both ends just constantly. I was on the toilet, and literally I, could, I couldn't hardly get out of bed to mm-hmm. go to the toilet. I was, I was dizzy. I was so bad. And Sven came up saw me and just said Look, take as long as you need I then ended up my brother-in-law came and picked me up I ended up in hospital went back to the apartment where the Crystal Palace doctor came put me on a drip but put, <laughs> got to get, it doesn't get any better he, he put a, a needle into my arm to put me on the drip and it came out the other side he says oh we're, 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 good job I'm not scared of needles but no. uh, um, oh we'll do that again shall we Did he, he should have just said <laughs> acupuncture <laughs> <laughs> But I felt, uh, you know, I felt so bad anyway. So that was that was minuscule to how how bad I'd felt. And then some reports were on social media or whatever it might have been that said, "Oh, you should give your right arm to play for England and, and this and that." But I could, I'd have been a disgrace. I could I could hardly walk, let alone kick a ball. So I ended up missing out on that that game. Or what would have been a full England debut? And this was in build-up, in preparation of what should have been the summer of your life. Yeah. Did effectively become, in a different way, the summer of your life. Because this would have been a chance to play for England at the World Cup in Japan and South Korea, right? Yes. And, and am I right to say that legitimately you'd forced your way into being in that squad, even though you're a late mention... And I think you were told that you were going to go. And eventually, it's Mark Keown that goes, but had you played and played at the level you were at against Paraguay, it's fair to say there's a good chance you'd have been on that plane, right? Well, I was, <laughs> I was, I've got my suit. I've, I've, I've got my England suit in preparation. To, measured to, up. To, measured up, got it, yeah. I had the David Beckham pre-launch party invitations. Uh, we played Liverpool a day before the official squad was being announced yeah. that, that we're going to the World Cup. And... Sven Goran Eriksson was there, said to they, he'd met Sunas in between, and Sunas came to me and said, "By the way, you go into the World Cup. Sven's just told me to tell you not to get injured." Mm-hmm. So I played in this, played against Liverpool. I think we lost four three in the end, but I scored and I played well. So um, that, that, that little bug in your head about like, don't get injured, you just ignore that. And yeah, played. you just ignore. You play. You play the match in some way. Yeah, you know, stand behind a swing, <laughs> etc. But. Um, yeah, so I just played, played well. Um, we unfortunately got beat four three, but I, I, you know, I'm going. I'm on the way back home from from Liverpool. I went to the World Cup. Mm. I went to the World Cup the next day. 
next day in the morning, uh, we, went, we, we came in for a, a warm down, a cool down, um, recovery jog. Suna says, uh, you can stay in and look at your name being announced on the, but uh, you're in, don't worry about it, you're in. You can come out with us and do a warm down or you can stay in here and, and be proud of, of what you've achieved. There was a delay on the, the team being announced and further delay and then it, then it got further delayed. So I, I went out and did, did, a, did a jog with the, with the lads, did a, a warm down. There's no dread in the stomach at this stage going, well, hold on, where, where's, the, where's the news? It, it's still like, ice ah, it's, it's coming. Yeah, it was, it, it was just a, a postpone for media or whatever it was. Continued to be delayed and then on the way home, driving back to Manchester from, from Brockhall, they announced the team over the radio and my name wasn't on it and I must, must have mis, mis, misheard that. Carried on, then my phone started going, they've taken Martin Keown instead of you. Um, so the agent's frantically, not well, agent, my brother-in-law, is, is trying to find out exactly what's happened and uh, they, they opted to take cover rather than, rather than myself. So emblematic of that, Ericsson, Torgrit, Rain caution, conservatism, mm. no risk, mm. it, in, in team talks, in tactics, in his personality, how he spoke. I mean, it's not an attack on him, but I think that, that as much as it cost you, that's so emblematic of what Sven was like. Yeah, I mean, it was frustrating, but at that time, I'm, I'm thinking, I've had a great season, we've, I've scored in the cup final, we've won, we've beaten Spurs in the cup final, my time's coming. As soon as they come back next season, I'll, I'll play for England. So that's what I believed, and that's that's where I was at that particular moment. Do that that pinch. I mean, that pinch is having a, a very. That's a very robust psychology to have. But I think that I know a lot of players who that would have hurt deeply, and it would have taken them a long, long time to go over. With. But I, you weren't in that. I, I was gutted. Yeah, obviously you're frustrated, yeah. disappointed, and you're thinking, "I'm going to the World Cup." I think my my wife Lucy, she she was my girlfriend at that time. She. Her dad had got permission for her to postpone or delay her degree, a final, a final, final exam, yeah, yeah. Um, to come out and uh, to, to come out to the uh, Baden Baden or something like that she and got criticised for it. But she was she was going to come to that because it was fact I was going. And then at the eleventh hour, obviously they've they've changed their mind and t- went with caution, like you say, rather than risk. But yes, you're disappointed. Yes, you're frustrated. 24, I'd had a good season. That's what I mean, you're able to... Uh, this isn't you rationalising it now. You were able to rationalise it, feel confident about, yeah, my time's coming. Yeah, that's how I felt. I think that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty strong. Uh, I don't know, that, that, uh, that's what I felt, and I felt my time's coming. I'm still going to play for England. I, I, that's your dream. Uh, you know, your dream is to play for your, for your country. I've done it in the 21s. I've never seen my dad cry. And he said that the only time you'll ever see me shed a tear is when you make your debut for England. And I've never been able to do it. I've never been able to make him cry. <laughs> Where's the suit? I think it'll be in the cellar somewhere. I'm frustrated with it, so you know, you just. Did you go to Beckham's party? I didn't go. I didn't feel like it was. It, I didn't feel it was right. I've got the invitation, but this is the one where they had Mark cast Keys, of thousand. Yeah, yeah. And was Elton John not performing yeah, or some yeah. such? Yeah, it was a pre-launch party. So yeah, I didn't feel it. I, I didn't feel that I was. If I wasn't going, I wasn't part of the team. So, but my time will come. You know, one of the reasons that we're here is because of the timing of what you've done. And it's worth pointing out to everybody that I've read Matt Jansen. I should say Matt Jansen, because yeah. you're of Dutch descent, right? Yes. The family's of Dutch descent. The book is very good. You, you've written your autobiography. It's a terrific read, but it hinges on something pretty central to your life, and it's what happens next. Therefore, I can't deny that I've got, you know, privileged access to details and that I've read it. And the subheading of your autobiography is what was, what is, and what might have been. The reason that it's necessary to use that is what happens that summer. And I I must admit that, I've said this to you before we started taping, I found that the the book's entertaining. I'd really encourage people to read it for dozens of reasons. It's very, very funny in certain parts. It's really detailed. It, It seems to me very honest. A lot of sports autobiographies kind of shade detail and all. Such and such happened, but I better not name them. But you tell it as it 
at least as far as the reader is concerned, you tell it as it was. But I find it also, it's quite a difficult, I wouldn't say traumatic read, but it's an upsetting read because of the injustice of what's going to happen next and because of the frustration in knowing that um, it robbed you of things, it robbed us, the viewers, of things because, you know, we love football because of players like you. When, when you turn a match on or you pay your ticket and you go to a ground, you want to see players doing what you did. I don't know if it's going to be difficult or traumatic to go back over what happened next and, and, and how you had to try to cope with it. When you thought of, yeah, he, got injury, he was a bit injury prone and then he fell away and went down the leagues, it's, it's, that hurts really. I was flying at Blackburn, I, I was confident as, as anybody, um, give me the ball, let me show off. You know, I'm, I'm going to um, miss out on the England World Cup squad, but I'm going to play for England. I'm, I'm really getting my, I'm getting more and more confidence. I'm getting better and better as a player. And then crash bang wallop. Instead of going to the World Cup, I decided to go to, to Rome with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and did what to, to get around what what the locals did. Used we we hired a, a scooter, went to the Trevi Fountain, Colosseum, everything. Everything was brilliant. We're different ages, but it's the iconic you know image of Rome: Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn, Roman Holiday on a scooter. You know, a young sort of fit guy and a glamorous girlfriend scooting around the Eternal City. It was brilliant. It's what you do. Yeah, and I was on. I was the happiest man in the world. I've, yeah, obviously you're disappointed you haven't gone to the World Cup, but. My life was getting complete. I'd found my future wife. I was on top of the world football-wise, um, confident. Everything was going. Everything was going great. Other than the World Cup, obviously, but everything was in my life was going great and, and moving forward. Then crash. I was involved in a motorcycle or um, scooter accident and was in a coma for six six days. That's how my world went from the highs of the high to the lows of the low. But in Rome, do you, you don't, I presume you don't remember what, uh, much about it. I remember, I, I remember that we were, we were going back to the hotel from wherever, the Trek Fountain or wherever we'd been, and my wife's helmet flew off. We weren't looking for it, couldn't find it anywhere. But she speaks, she speaks Italian, and we, we, there was some police over the other side. We said, look, are we all right to carry on? We, our hotel's just around the corner. Are we OK to carry on? Because we haven't got a helmet. And she says, OK, but make sure you... You get a helmet for, for, for driving around. That's what she relayed to me. So I said, do you want my helmet mm. to her? And I passed her my helmet. She, and she says, no, no, you, you keep your helmet on because you're driving. You might as well. We're only up the road. So we, we come up. To, so I, ke- I kept the helmet on. Would you be alive today? Do you no, think I don't if, think so. If well, I was, given... in a coma, I was in a coma for six days with a helmet on. When the, when the moped is tipped by this wildly driven taxi, I, that helmet saves your life. Probably. Well, yeah, I... I because we weren't travelling, we were stopped at a junction, and, and if you've ever been to Rome, the, the cars are bumper to bumper, and um, they just park anywhere and move, <laughs> bump into cars to move in. So it's just at, at this crossroads, and I'm edging my way out at the crossroads, and as I'm edging my way out at the crossroads, a taxi comes, and I take the brunt of the taxi on my side of the face helmet, and my wife's thrown off the back. I've taken the impact of the taxi, mm-hmm. and I'm in a pool of blood on the floor, and she's... In a way, it, I mean, she sometimes says now it's worse for her because she saw it all and she, she was panicky. And it, to me, I, I can't remember. I, I remember up to the point of impact and then nothing else. Then it was in an ambulance. She, they put a sheet over me, I think, and she said they, 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 thought I'd, they thought I was dead. And she was screaming and crying, saying, squeeze my hand, squeeze my hand. If you can, if you can hear me, can you hear me? And apparently, I, I can't remember this, but subconsciously or whatever it was, something it, inside you responded something, to it. Yeah, and, and she said, "He's no, he's, st- he's, he's still alive." <laughs> whatever she said, because I, <laughs> I was out of it. But um, they, they uh, took me into the hospital. Apparently, it was the seediest, worst hospital going. Then it was recovery. It was just slowly but surely getting my memory back, getting my balance, being able to walk again. I was really unsteady on my feet. Um, I went to, I used to go for tests at John Moore, John Moore's University in Liverpool. The questions were so basic, you know, problem-solving questions to, to see how my, my mind was. And now, I haven't get, it was like for six-year-olds probably that could, could answer it. Um, and I got most of them wrong. And then bit by bit, they would get better and better. 
but I was told that he, he's unlikely to, to ever play football again. Um, I had brain hemorrhage, you know, bleeding in the brain, but it was the frontal lobe, which is where you learn all the normal things that came naturally. Um, so like, for example, getting in a car, you don't get in a car and think, right, I've got to unlock the car, I've got to put the car, I've got to press the ignition, I've got to... Put the, you don't, you just do it. There's no stages, it's yeah, fluid. It's automatic, yeah. And my football at the time was automatic. My frontal lobe got damaged and everything wasn't automatic. Everything was, right, the ball's coming to me now. Right, I've got to... So it was, everything was obviously slower because you, you're thinking about everything. It just wasn't automatic. It was just, this is wrong. I couldn't get away from the spiral that I wasn't invincible. You know, I wasn't this invincible. I could get damaged, I could get hurt. That destroyed my ego, my belief system, my how I was c continuing on this rise because my ego and confidence and invincibility was, was growing and growing and growing. It had just been destroyed. But then the next stage of your <laughs> recuperation, rehabilitation or struggles, I don't know what best to term it, was understanding your own psychology, your own mind, because you relatively quickly quicker than anybody thought possible. You were physically fit, you were playing again, scoring again, sometimes scoring brilliantly. But the book makes clear that everything was absolutely wrong in your psychology. You were, you were not only um, struggling, you were in real pain. And until Steve Peters, which comes a little bit later, you weren't getting either the ear or the shoulder or the advice or the definition of what was going on that you needed. No, I, 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 kept, I kept saying, I, I'm not right, I'm not right, this, I've missed something, I'm not, you know, I, I don't feel the same, I'm not the same player, I'm, I can't, it's just not natural, I'm, I'm brain damaged, I'm this, that, and I kept questioning because I wasn't the same player, I, like my, invent, my bubble had burst. So I, I couldn't understand why people said, "Oh yeah, you'll be fine. Just get a few games. You'll 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 be you'll get through it." And you, but I, I I was now going on the pitch fearful, uh, and where I where I wanted the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball. I want to show you what I can do. Give me the ball. I was, I oh, don't give me the ball. Don't give me the ball. Or when you do give me the ball, I'm thinking, right, control it, and and it was just, and I couldn't cope with that. It was just, and then playing in front of so many fans and that sound oh, it was awful and, and it was resulted in me getting worse and worse and then I was on anti antidepressants and drinking he really heavily and trying to get away from it just because I couldn't cope with what I had been and now what I thought I was but because I, I, I was at so low I thought I've got, to, I've got to I've got to try whatever I can try I still think I'm brain damaged I think there's that, a psychologist won't, a psychiatrist, psychologist, they won't know what's, what's happening inside my head. I, I know, uh, my, my, my thoughts were, there's still something wrong. So then I was introduced to, to Dr. Professor Steve Peters, and I loved spending time with him, and he used the chimp analogy. Steve Peters is very famous, we can talk more about him, because you were one of his earliest sporting patients, and he's gone on to prove his ability and he's going to help a lot of people but when you talk about that chimp principle he, he, you know there's a very famous book about it but not everybody will have experienced it now if I stress if I understand what he's trying to argue is that again I, I recognise that everybody's got a voice or a presence inside their head which will tell them you're wrong or you've failed or it's an anarchic voice and it seems to be a voice that seizes upon your weakest moments that kind of, if there's a wound, it'll rub salt in it. Is, is that, that's not very comprehensive, but is that beginning to explain what he told you when he mentioned yeah, I mean, chimp inside you? Yeah, we've all got a chimp, say we've all got a chimp inside us, and when you're in your good times, you can control your chimp. When you're in your negative times, your chimp controls you. But my chimp was controlling me, and some. You know, I, the, my chimp was too big to be... You know, I, I couldn't get the better of my King chimp. Kong. But my, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'd, I'd go for a, a meet. He was at Sheffield at the time. I'd drive over to Sheffield, have a meeting with him. He'd, he'd I'd always say, yeah, but this, or yeah, but that. And he'd, he'd have an answer to everything and, and, and t talk about my chimp and, and how to control this and how to control it. And I'd go back really positive and training. 
it would be under control again yeah, to a degree. Under control to a degree, yeah. And I thought, oh, actually, yeah, he, he's answered all my questions he's, and my or all my doubts and negativity. Yeah, he's, he's, he's given me rational answers too. Built me back, so I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to training on the Monday again. So Monday comes, Tuesday comes, Wednesday, and then Thursday. But slowly but surely, I'm deflated again. So he, and then the following week, I'm going to see Steve. And he inflates me. I get oh, all right. Those questions he's answered rationally. That I doubt. Yeah, but yeah, but I'm feeling okay again. Or I feel okay, not necessarily invincible again. I just feel that can manage. It's noticeably helping. Yes. By the end of the week again, I've got to get see him because it's. Uh, it, he's always said, he's always said himself if he'd have been there constantly with me, mm-hmm. or at the side of the pitch, or just before <laughs> I'm going onto the pitch, yeah. it may have helped a lot more I'm now out of the the horrific stages when I was crying at night not sleeping drinking heavily and depressed I can't get this right I'm, I've come out the other side of that now what did you learn about yourself it was a gradual frustration and then I, I, I wanted to get away from football completely I, this is going to cure me I just got to get away from football I know that I can't do it anymore and then I get a phone call from an ex-colleague of mine, Gary Flickcroft. And I think that helped me have a little bit of a direction. or a li- I think That helped me maybe get over being so depressed. I mean, I, was, I wasn't depressed. When, once I'd left football, I thought it was going to cure me. But after six months of doing nothing and, and you're bored, you get bored, you do. You think the grass is always greener, but it, but it wasn't. And then I get a phone call out of the blue um, from Gary Flickcroft saying he, he was managing... Um, Lee, Lee Genesis at the time I think it was and would I come and play I said I'm not, I don't want to play but I'll, I'll, I'll come and be your assistant um, and he says yeah okay and will you play a couple of games in the, in the, so I said well I'll, 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 yeah I'll be a player player assistant manager so I did that started doing my coaching badges and, and, and got so there was something that I was focusing on rather than just drifting through through life and, and away from, away completely out of football and uh, thinking that that was the answer and then he a few, few years later after a couple of promotions he, he stepped aside and to concentrate on his property property businesses and then I was thrust into to management at Chorley Chorley Football Club which I spent three years had three successful years there promotion in one year? Uh, we got into playoff final uh, and, and got, got beat in extra time I wish I hadn't read it um, yeah, so. <laughs> sorry about that yeah, it was three successful years. A few uh, disagreements with the the board. Apart for the as, as, management. As in football, as not <laughs> as typical in football, and ended up uh, resigning after after a summer of putting a, a really fantastic team together. I brought in two or three extra players that maybe gave us a, a chance the following season. But you, you but you you weren't able to see the fruit so of I your work. So I wasn't able to see the fruit, the fruits, but. No, it was good. It's good that they got promoted there. You know, I enjoyed my time, um, but it gave me a focus on, on on something. We're drawing to a close because I want people to understand what you communicate and what I think is a really captivating, really page-turning autobiography. I don't know where you want to go, but I think people, oh, because some younger listeners won't have had the privilege that Neil and I had of seeing that you were an extremely good footballer, but you're also somebody who lived inside this odd, lovable, eccentric world of football, so choose. The things that you can come across in football is is crazy. Um, Fergie, what might yeah, what could have been if I'd have chose to, to go to Manchester United rather than rather than Crystal Palace? It is hindsight again, it is hypothetical, could it? He handled it quite well, didn't he? For, oh well I, I didn't. I was petrified. I was in Michael Knighton's office and my dad told me that I'd need I, if I'd chosen Crystal Palace, I'd need to call up Sir Alex and uh, tell him that you you were going to sign for Crystal I, Palace. I love that. I think now that's good. Knowing that the hairdryer treatment and that was <laughs> well documented. And, yeah, I've had um, that. I'm in sat in Carlisle United's boardroom at um, 18, 19 years old. Hi, Sir Alex. Uh, I'm, I've chose Crystal Palace uh, uh, over you. Really? Uh, yeah. It's just because I want to want to want to play first team football and continue playing first team football like I have been at Carlisle United. And he says, "Why would I be signing you if you if I didn't want you to play for my first team?" And he and I says, "Well, I've, I've made my decision." He says, "Okay, son. Well, I wish you all the best, and hopefully our paths will, will cross again. Good luck to you." And that was classy, classy, yeah, brilliant.
if only Wembley hadn't been under reconstruction, but in Cardiff, you won a beautiful final, uh, one where I was very heavily rooting for Blackburn Rovers, uh, given my uh, dislike for the manager of Spurs that day. <laughs> but you, you scored, you made, you did exactly what I cut. Talk about dreams. What lives with you from that day in Cardiff when Blackburn play Tottenham in the League Cup final? You mentioned about people being nervous or petrified and mm-hmm. Terry Butcher and doing meditation and what have you. But I, I felt the bigger the game, the more comfortable I was because you were achieving more. So it worked in, in, in a bizarre, weird way for me. Mm-hmm. I was, it's the final, closed roof, it's going to be capacity. We're the underdogs, we've got nothing to do. We're, we're playing Tottenham and, you know... Who were who were heavily favourites to win this? Well, so we're going to go out and, and give it give it everything and got the early the early goal. Um, I, I, I scored the first goal. They equalised and then managed to set Coley up for the for the winner and winning a major trophy or a, uh, the football league trophy was uh, well. Yeah, I'm getting better and better and it's my it, my ego, my invincibility is growing and shortly after that it was the England and and, and growing still and from Carlisle to Palace, to Blackburn, then to the Cup Final, then to England. It, it was a gradual, or not quite quick, uh, rise to getting bigger and No matter his rough warning, that should have been a day for tears from your dad. It should have been. Well, um, he said he was close, but he's still... He's, <laughs> he's, well, I, I couldn't see whether he's lying to me. Or not. <laughs> so, yeah. I think you've nailed it there. Yeah, yeah. You've nailed it there. Now, I mean, obviously the best goal of the three is yours that goes without saying but Andy Cole's finish was quite nifty it was nice but I had a goal and assist though didn't I he just had a goal <laughs> love it love it <laughs> yes it's time for the Bet365 question thanks to our sponsors at the world's favourite online betting company they wanted to know more about Matt's special partnership with goal-scoring legend Andrew Cole. So we asked him. That's what I want to finish on. Like You've, you've played with some super players, but you, you, Dwight York came at a point when you were fighting the fight that we've described. Andy Cole, not so. Describe playing with Andy Cole. Describe. Do, do, do you think it's possible that people underestimate a little bit about how good a striker it was, how good a finisher it was. Did you enjoy working with him? I think that my most successful season was when Coley came. We had a, a, a player called Chicho Grabby who hadn't, hadn't, didn't quite work, did hadn't it? settled. I felt as soon as Coley came in, it, it clicked and it worked. And I thought, I'm playing with a good quality striker. And it, it was only for one season because I got, obviously mm-hmm. I got the accident after that but what might have been if I'd have not had the accident I could have struck up a really good striking relationship with him and I was robbed of that as well so but uh, frustrating but like I say he, he was he was a quality player well we find ourselves here uh, somewhere that is beautiful would you say happily married dad of three kids you achieve brilliant things that either of us would We'd risk a puffin <laughs> bite <laughs> in order to get. It's really thrilling that, um, one, you managed to achieve what you managed to achieve because that, a personal battle is probably the hardest battle any of us will ever face. And it's exciting to think that um, football's going to benefit from you because you left the idea that management, coaching, call it what you will, and they're two different skills, is something that still attracts you. So I hope that that's going to be the next time, next time we see you triumphing in in the sport that you love, we are going to, at some stage, see you coaching and managing, I hope. In, in some capacity, that's the idea. Hopefully, before too long. Well, in that case, meantime, until that does happen, I'd urge people to go and seek your autobiography, not um, as a quid pro quo, because you've talked to us, because it's, it's really enjoyable, intriguing, and the pages fly by. It's not always the easiest read, but it's true. And to my way of thinking, it's a good life. Thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Big Interview. It's produced by me, which sounds egotistical, but it's also true. Graham Hunter and Backpage. Our music is by Beer Jacket, who else? 
editing by Charlie McGarry. Thank you to our hosts at Acast and our loyal sponsors at Bet365. We're also supported by our socios. Find out how to become a socio, how to support us at patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter. Here endeth the lesson.